when I heard about this workshop, I, I offered to uh, to contribute about the the potential of seafloor drilling systems for polar projects uh, from two aspects. First of all, my part in in planning and participating in a, a seafloor drilling expedition, and then also what the potential of the Sir David Attenborough is going forwards for operate as a platform for seafloor drills, and also uh, with it the the giant piston coring system that we'll have. And so. I was taken up on this opportunity, so uh, so that's um, there we go. Yeah. So these are the things I want to talk about. First of all, uh, a few years ago, we we did this expedition on the Polish Stern using the the Maram Mibo seventy, and I think there's there's some things come out of that, uh, some lessons come out of that about using seafloor drills on uh, on polar continental shell. So I, I'll talk a bit about that. And then I'll go on to talk about where we are with the Sir David Attenborough and its potential as a platform for seafloor drilling systems in the polar regions. And thirdly, uh, I hadn't realized that uh, IODP, UK IODP was going to start thinking about giant piston coring systems, but seeing as uh, they are now, I should mention the, the giant piston coring system that will be available on the Sir David Attenborough. So before getting into those things, I just want to take a step back and review some of the challenges we particularly face with scientific drilling in polar regions. Uh, so there's a list of them here. I mean, the first thing is that the Joides resolution has rather limited ice strengthening. So there are a lot of places it's really never going to go, even if even when you can get it to go to polar areas, which is is maybe once or twice a decade. Uh, secondly, of course, Drifting icebergs and ice flows may force your vessel off site. So uh, that's a constraint in how long you can spend on any particular site. And then particularly on the continental shells, the stratigraphies are often very interrupted by numerous unconformities, which is, results from erosion during past ice sheet advances. So you may have to put together uh, a stratigraphic record from, from lots of pieces and particularly uh, and that's exacerbated by the fact that glacial sediments and particularly the unlithified uh, glacial sediments where you've got a real contrast between uh, hard drop stones and, and the soft sediments, they are really difficult lithologists to obtain good core recovery. And, and a, measure, a measure of that is that the, the best Antarctic shelf recovery achieved on the Joides resolution is, is 63%. And everybody was really excited to get such good uh, recovery when that happened. But it should be noted that where people ha have operated engineering style drills uh, from a, a sea ice platform, uh, much better recovery has been obtained. There's a whole series of drilling projects that have taken place over the last uh, 35 years from sea ice, uh, the best known is perhaps Andril, where they've achieved something like 98% recovery, so that it is possible to do better. And uh, finally, a problem you often have in polar regions is you can't get the really kind of precise core, cr core chronologies that you see from many uh, lower latitude drilling legs, which rely on the oxygen isotope record from carbonate microfossils, because in many places, the, the carbonate microfossils are exceedingly rare or absent. So uh, seafloor drills can't sol solve all of those problems for us, but they do have uh, some potential advantages which can help with some of those issues. Uh, so uh, seafloor drills can be operated from ice class research vessels, which means you can take them to places where the, the JR is very unlikely ever to go. And secondly, a, a seafloor drill sitting on the seafloor is a stable platform. So that then gives you the opportunity to, to use lighter weight drilling tools and to drill with steadier weight on the bits. And hence that they at least have the potential to get better core recovery. They're not necessarily uh, there yet completely, but you have the potential. The, the diagram I've put in at the bottom is one from Alex Pine, who was the chief drilling engineer on the Andril projects. And he maintains that a really important parameter is the ratio of the size of the hole you drill to the, the diameter of the core you recovered. Because uh, the, the bigger the hole you drill, the more energy you're putting into the ground and the more 
likely uh, the, the core that you're trying to recover within that hole is going to suffer some damage at the time. And uh, the, the, the worst example that he, he shows there is the, the, J, the JR extended core barrel, where the, uh, the core you're covering is only 4% of the area of the hole. And on the right are the Andrel tools with which they got these amazing recoveries. So the, a third advantage I'll mention of seafloor drills is that there is the potential for more efficient drilling of, of offset sites and drip, dipping truncated successions because you don't have to build your pipe to the seafloor and you haven't got to trip to the surface between, uh, between each core. So I want to say a bit about this uh, expedition where we used the Mebo drill on the Antarctic shelf four years ago. First of all, the opportunity uh, was highlighted by uh, seismic profiles. And this comes back to one of the main limitations of seafloor drills is that you need targets that are relatively close to the seafloor. And this is the classic circumstance where you have a dipping succession that's truncated at and near the seafloor. So by a series of offset drill sites, you can get a whole range, you can sample a whole range of the stratigraphy. So we thought this was, this is what we're probably looking at in these seismic profiles is a Cretaceous to recent uh, succession, uh, which likely somewhere in there is a, is a complete record of the history uh, of the West Antarctic ice sheet. So also we, we thought this was a good target for shallow drilling. And ultimately we settled on the idea of doing this with uh, the Mebo seafloor drill. Uh, so this was at a time before the, MIBO and the, um, the Rock Drill 2 had been adopted by IODP as mission specific platforms. So we put together a, a consortium, it organized this through a consortium of inst institutions in Germany and, and the UK. And indeed, uh, we persuaded UK IODP to put some funding into this. So the case being that uh, this would enable uh, UK academics to gain some experience of operating with this, this technology in polar regions. And this was a kind of buy-in that allowed, enabled uh, people from, as well as from Bass, from uh, Imperial College and University of Southampton to, to participate in, in the expedition. So this is a, a slide about the operations on board. So the Polish Stern is, is a pretty large research vessel, much larger than most of us in the UK are used to working with. It's 118 meters overall length. But even on a vessel of that size, uh, the Mebo or RD2 would be the same. It's got quite a large footprint in terms of the, uh, the amount of deck space it's gonna take up from the, the, the drill itself, its winch, its control cabin, and various other containers with tools and spares that you need. So on, on this deck, on the deck plan here, this is, is marked out. Everything in red is, is some component related to the Mebo, which uh, on the Polish stern was deployed over the stern A-frame with its, its feet. There's a diagram of the Mebo on the bottom right. You can see these disc-shaped uh, feet. These are folded up against the side for, for deployments. This shows where we went and where the sites are. So in total on uh, one and a half months of operations, we drilled 11 site, well, 11 holes at nine sites. So a total, a total drilling depth of, uh, aggregate drilling depth of 162 meters uh, to a maximum subsea floor depth of only just over 35 meters. Overall that, the, the total amount of core recovered was just 57 meters uh, with recoveries ranging from as low as 7% to as high as 76% and uh, drilling into a range of, of lithologies from very soft material to consolidated sedimentary rocks. So what were the lessons from, from this drilling? Well, I think there were quite a few. Uh, first of all, we found, despite the fact that there's a lot of experienced people on here, we found that drifting icebergs and sea ice proved even more disruptive to the drilling than we'd anticipated. So the mitigations that you can put in place for this is, first of all, have a, a lot of potential alternate sites so you can go to where the ice isn't. 
And secondly, sea ice uh, intelligence in terms of remote sensing or aerial surveillance is very important. So on the Polar Stern, we had helicopters that we could do aerial surveillance. We had daily very high quality synthetic aperture radar uh, satellite images coming in, which showed us how the sea ice was moving around. Um, aerial surveillance these days, you, you, can, you can do in many areas, you can do quite a lot with drones. So this is something that's come along in the last few years. And a third bit of uh, mitigation for sea ice and icebergs is, is really, I think, very valuable to have a vessel with dynamic positioning and strong, strong thrusters. I actually, nobody actually told me the Polar Stern didn't have dynamic positioning until we got to sea. And so this involved many long hours of manual control of the thrusters by the navigating officers who did a fantastic job, but it's not ideal. Something else that's very important to know, if, you've only, if your maximum drill depth is only 70 meters before sea floor, below seafloor, you really need to know, uh, have an accurate picture of the quaternary cover thickness. So site survey, high, high resolution site survey with acoustic sub bottom profilers and, and high resolution seismic reflection profiles is really important. A lot of standard exploration seismic is really not good enough to, to show you those top few meters below the seafloor accurately enough to know where, at what depth you're gonna reach your target formations and indeed to know when you have reached them to dis distinguish between uh, what's in the core is overburden and what's the target. So another thing we learned is that the core recovery is really strongly affected by the choice of drill bit and core catcher that you select and on the few occasions where we had a second attempt at the same site, we, we achieved much better recovery because the people setting up the seafloor drill had a much better idea of what they were drilling into and could choose the appropriate tools. So if that can be built into the planning stage, I think that's a really useful thing and helpful thing to do. Another lesson is that the, a seafloor drill is a very complex bit of equipment and it's often going to need some maintenance time between holes, between sites. So if you've got it on a, a fully fledged research vessel, you've got a very expensive asset there that can be doing other things during the downtime. So it, it's well worth planning for alternative programs that you can do in the downtime. So uh, if you want to read more about what we learned from the operational side of this expedition, there's a paper that you can read in uh, G cubed. So one final thing about iceberg uh, mitigating for icebergs and drifting ice is that because uh, a vessel operating a seafloor drill hasn't got a drill string connecting to the seafloor, it, it has got a little bit more flexibility in how it can move around. Although not, not that much, uh, we were trying to stay within a radius of 50 meters, even when the drill was on seafloor a thousand meters below. But that is, a, that is a little bit of flexibility, which can allow you to, to dodge some smaller to medium sized pieces of ice. This was the largest one we tried to dodge and we didn't exactly manage to totally dodge it. We, it, it was kind of eased around the bow of the ship uh, while the, the drill stayed on the seafloor. Uh, and even though we only got 57 meters of core, some of this is proving to be incredibly valuable in learning uh, about Antarctic past climates and paleo environments. And this was the, the first, paper, first major paper that's come out of the results. There are, the, this was on a, a bit of late Cretaceous core that was recovered. There are other papers that are currently in preparation on younger parts of the record, which tell us about the onset of the West Antarctic ice sheet and its, its development. So now going on to the Sir David Attenborough uh, and, and what that will be able uh, to achieve for us. Uh, so the, you may, many of you will know that the, the vessel uh, is now entering its sea trials phase and the, the aim is for it to come into full service in, in 2023. So, the ship has been equipped with a, it's well equipped with a range of stuff for, for geoscience research. 
uh, and to be able to accommodate larger items of equipment that are operated by National Marine Facilities and by BGS. What we want to particularly focus on here are the things highlighted in red, the, the BGS rock drill, the RD2, and the giant piston corer that, the, uh, that will be available on the ship. So the, the Sir David Attenborough is a very large ship. It's uh, overall length 129 meters. So we're talking about a vessel that's even larger than the Polish Stern. So, and it has a very large aft deck space, uh, 35 meters length, not including the side deck. It's a total area of 670 meters square. So there's plenty of space to accommodate uh, a seafloor drill. And there's indeed, we've got, uh, schematics layout, deck layouts that show how RD2, for example, could be accommodated on the deck. And that the, on this uh, layout in the lower right here, uh, everything that's shaded in red is, is related, would, is the containers and the winch and the drill related to, to RD2. You can see this would still be space to, for a few other things on the deck. The, uh, the picture in the lower right is a, is a RD2 in a, a previous version of it uh, on the deck of the James Clark Ross uh, during a public event that was held in Edinburgh some years ago. So we, so as as in that previous slide, we could certainly deploy uh, a seafloor drill over the side of the Sir David Attenborough. However, the ship has also been built with a large four meter by four meter moon pool, and the aim is eventually to be able to deploy. Uh, the RD2 through this moon pool. And the moon pool sits within a large scientific hangar, so it's a relatively enclosed space, although it won't be totally closed, enclosed if we have the moon pool. So these photographs here show uh, the view of the scientific hangar space from uh, the winch controller's uh, position for, uh, not for, that wouldn't be the, where the winch controller for RD2 would probably sit, but for other equipment going through the moon pool. Uh, the photo on the right is a picture looking down the moon pool when uh, the ship was under construction. Uh, and then here, what I've just brought in here is a picture looking aft within the uh, scientific hangar. The moon pool in this picture is half covered. One, one half of it has got its cover on. And we're looking, we're looking on, up on the right, you can see this control cab. And at the aft end, you can see this roller shutter door. So the idea is that RD2 in here would be deployed from the aft side of the moon pool and the winch would actually sit under that roller door. So it wouldn't be a totally enclosed space uh, in, in that instance, but it'd still be uh, pretty well sheltered from the elements. So uh, the, the other tool I said I'd talk about is the, a little bit is the giant piston corer, which uh, will be, has been made by Ozil. So it's, it's the same, giant piston core in essence that they have on the Jamstec uh, Kamai, which I, hear, I now hear that uh, is going to be used by e -cord. So up to a, a, a maximum barrel length of up to 40 meters, which is something we've not had on UK research vessels before. And I think it's actually the, the largest piston core that will be, have been available on any ice strength and polar research ship. So as a, a measure of the sort of thing you might be able to achieve with this in, in a place where you've got a really low set, a fairly low sedimentation rate of, of two centimeters, a thousand years or less, you could get a core record extending back more than two million years. Or to look at it another way, in a, in a reasonably high sedimentation rate, say eight centimeters per thousand years, 40 meters of core could take you back to half a million years and span several glacial interglacial cycles, including MIS 11. So the core would be deployed along the starboard side of the Sir David Attenborough using a set of davits. So this uh, is, is rather like the way that Driscoll corers were deployed on UK research vessels that some of you may remember. Uh, so the davits would progressively lower the end of the core around. Uh, it will be, it, this piston core will use an acoustic release system rather than a, a more traditional uh, piston arm. The ship will also be have its own multi-sensor core logging container, which doesn't quite have all the fancy sensors that the, the Leicester 
University One has, and in the first instance, it will have uh, magnetic susceptibility, P wave sensors, and uh, gamma ray attenuation density. It's other sensors may be added in the future. But particularly, uh, so this would be available for drill core or multi cent or giant piston core or more ordinary uh, gravity and piston cores. Uh, um, a particularly nice thing about it is the, the, the wet lab on board has been designed, if you look at the photo in the lower right, has been designed with these uh, removable bulkheads so that the uh, container, containerized laboratories such as the multi-sensor core logging container can be connected directly onto the ship's wet lab. So in summary, these are, these are my uh, takeaway points. Uh, seafloor drilling systems, I think operated from ice class research vessels have great potential as uh, MSPs for the polar regions. I think that our 2017 expedition provides a number of lessons on how we can opt op optimize the use uh, uh, of uh, those seafloor drilling systems in the polar regions. The RRS Sir David Attenborough will be a potential platform for using seafloor drills. And I think the potential of uh, a seafloor drill that can go through a moon pool and a, uh, an ice strengthened research vessel with a moon pool is a, a, a really powerful combination uh, for potential future seafloor drilling expeditions. And the ship will also be equipped with a, a 40 meter giant piston corer and we're aiming for it to enter service, it, full service in 2023. Okay. Thank you very much, Rob. That was excellent. Very much enjoyed your, your talk. Okay, uh, let's just look at the chat and see what questions uh, might have come through. Uh, first question from Ustin. Great to see the capability of the SDA. I assume that the rock drill slash MIBO isn't part of the standard kit. How would an MSP expedition work here? Leased at IDP by Bass UK and then the drilling equipment leased separately or scope for an in-kind contribution. Um, Rob, I know it was your talk, but maybe I could, maybe I should take a stab at that one first and maybe you could follow up with a comment. Um, so first of all, <clears throat> Yes, so the, the rock drill to an amiibo kit isn't, isn't part of the standard kit. That would have to be brought on um, separately. Um, so in, how, in terms of how an expedition would work here, so yes, the ship would have to be supplied to the expedition. And ideally, we would like that as an in-kind contribution. So it'd be NERC making an in-kind contribution. It might be that that's not possible, in which case there might be some day rate that has to be paid by ECORD, but obviously there'd be a negotiation surrounding that to secure the ship and then ECORD would have to pay for the drilling system separately to come on board um, and I think the scope for an in-kind contribution from the rig providers would be much less. I think we'd be looking at actually hiring that kit outright to bring it on board. Um, so yeah we would build up the MSP from those two main components, the ship hopefully for free or as an in-kind contribution and then the drilling equipment uh, hired in separately. Rob, do you have anything you want to add to my answer? Yeah, I, I mean, something I, I, I had thought about saying and should say, I think, uh, Dave and I have had conversations about how we can organise a, a trial of the RD2 on, on the Sir David Attenborough. Uh, and I think this be, would be a really important thing to do to give people the confidence to write proposals to, uh, to use these facilities in combination. Uh, but a, a problem... There's not a trial scheduled at the moment, and in order to make it happen, uh, funding is going to be an issue. So, uh, we anybody who has any ideas on how that can be organised, we'd we'd be really interested to listen. Okay, uh, next question: uh, When you drill with a seafloor drill how long do the course typically sit at the sea floor before being brought up to the deck and what are the implications for microbiology? So that's a really good question. So for a 50 meter hole, so one of the kind of shallower holes that a rock drill might drill, the, the, the drill might be on the seabed for maybe between two and three days. Um, so the first core that you drill could potentially be sitting in the magazine 
on on the drill itself for up to three days before it comes back to the uh, to the ship. So obviously there is a there's an implication there for microbiology and I guess other studies that that, that where you're looking at ephemeral properties that you have a core taken out of its in situ location and then sitting there for for three days. I mean it's it's cold obviously at the bottom of the seabed, so you're not you're not bringing it up into ambient temperatures, but it is out of its natural position. Um, so we have for, the, for on both the rock drill and the amoeba, we do have um, pumps to to pump uh, tracers as we drill. Um, so those can be detected in the cores later. Uh, so you, the, some assessment on core contamination might be um, um, made, but of course that will only tell you what the contamination is through the drilling action. What would be harder to estimate is any change or, or contamination that might happen while the cores were sitting there on the seabed. So it, it is something that I think we could only advise the scientists what the conditions were that the cores were taken in and how they've been stored on, on the drill and then they would have to make a judgment themselves on, on what impact that's had on the cores. I know for Atlantis we had exactly these questions asked, you know, what is the impact on the cores? Uh, and I believe this, that the microbiologists on Atlantis managed to find a way to, to at least deal with that or estimate the impact. And, and so they, you know, when they saw the results, they could take that into account. So it is possible to, to do microbiology studies on cores that have been maybe sitting on a, on, on a drill for a couple of days. A uh, question from Damon here, is the moon pool on the SDA permanently covered or can the hangar be removed to allow a larger offshore rig to be built on the ship? Oh, that would, that would be great. Um, I think I know the answer to this, but I'll let Rob answer. Yeah, th this was something that was debated in the design uh, of the ship. Um, certainly from the geoscience point of view, we made the request that it, the, the science hangar should have uh, a removable roof so that you could mount a, a proper drill rig over the, the moon pool. But as with design and build of any multi-purpose vessel, compromises have to be made. And, uh, for, well, I won't go into all the reasons, but ultimately what's happened is that you've got about nine meters of a headroom in the science hangar, but above the science hangar is, is where the, the winch room is. So all the winch, so you can't open, you can't open the roof up. You can't, you can't put a drill, a big drill rig with a drill string going straight down the moon pool, unfortunately. Thanks, Rob. Uh, next question from Tom. What's the UK pathway for SDA piston coring missions outside of ECORD and MSPs? And will the SDA only be operating in polar oceans? Are there, is there any scope for projects on the way there and back? Do you want to have a stab at that one, Rob? So um, it's actually it's actually maybe three questions in one. We'll take the first the first part first. So you know what is the you know what is the how would a researcher um, get a piston coring mission on this Sir David Adler? Oh well, I think the the usual way of of getting any kind of uh, research crews on a UK research vessel uh, you write write a grant proposal to uh, to NERC or some form of EU funding or other funding agency and put in a, uh, through the Marine Facilities Planning website, put in a, a ship time in marine equipment form. So that would be a way of, of getting the, uh, the giant piston corer. If you didn't want to, if, if you didn't want to do it through uh, as a, an IODP or ECORD expedition. And will the SDA be operating only in the polar oceans or you know, is there room to have to do something on the way there or on the way back? Um, that remains to be tested. I think in theory, it would be possible to do something. I mean, the ship in most years will transit up and down the Atlantic. So uh, there would be scope to propose something uh, along that route. I mean, in the past, the James Clark Ross, the existing ship did uh, a, a significant research cruise in the Caribbean one year, but the ship has, been designed for polar research and there will be a lot of pressure on on science time so uh, yeah i mean i i think it's it, it's there for people to write proposals that can go into open competition but you will be in competition with a lot of, of polar proposals i think
Okay, uh, another question here about um, site survey data. Is there a scope to use the SDA to acquire site survey data? So it will have multi-beam capability, but what about seismic acquisition, Rob? Um, so the, the, uh, what we decided is that if, if somebody wants to do major multi-channel seismic, then there is a national facility for that. And people should propose to bring on the multi-channel streamer and larger air gun arrays from uh, national marine facilities. However, um, for certainly a lot of the cruises I do, we often want a much more compact seismic system that we can run in parallel with other operations, with other kinds of science. And so what we have got, what we've, we've got for the SDA is a short high resolution streamer and a couple of uh, generator injector guns and uh, a containerized compressor. So the ship can do some basic high resolution uh, seismic profiling with, with equipment that's available dedicated to it. And, and I, I, I actually have tested out the streamer. I managed to persuade um, Bass to let me take it on a crew, uh, on an American ship I was going on last year. And we used the streamer there and it performed very well. 